The gospel lesson for this Sunday, the third Sunday of Easter, comes from the gospel of John, the 21st chapter, verses 1 through 19 in the New Testament on page 115. If you remember from last week's reading, uh, particularly verse 30, which is the last of that previous chapter, it says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through believing you may have life in his name. Sounds kind of like an ending, doesn't it? Most scholars believe that it was originally the ending and that one of John's disciples, members of his church, later decided it needed an epilogue. And so this chapter 21 was added. And, but this chapter 21 is a fruitful chapter for the church and worthy of our devotion and consideration. So please hear these words. John 21, 1 through 19. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the sea of Tiberias. And he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple who Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Jesus said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. 
Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. And this he said to him, follow me. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. This uh, text brings up several rather practical questions. Most of us have seen the type of clothing people wore in that day and age, long robes and tunics and all of this. And so it's always struck me why Peter would put clothes on and then jump into the sea, because wouldn't the clothes just weigh him down? It's not unusual for fishermen to fish naked. Growing up, I remember going fishing. I've never been a fisherman in my own right, for the most part. I've always wanted to be a fisherman, but I don't know that much about it. My dad was a happenstance fisherman. And so most of my experience of fishing growing up was going out with some of the uh, deacons from the church to a river, a lake, a pond. And I can remember to this day going out with some deacons at night to fish for mud cat or channel cat in a river. And we stripped naked. And with a big net, we climbed down into this river and started walking up the river with this net trying to catch catfish. I felt extraordinarily vulnerable. Not so much from the nakedness, but from not knowing what was in the water. And catfish, to be honest, are kind of scary for young children, if not older folks. And in the case of channel cat or mud cat, they were bigger than I was. But that's my recollection of fishing nude. And it was related to being out with the church. But later as I got older, particularly as I reached an adult age and became the owner of a architectural millwork in Fayetteville, Arkansas, fishing took on a whole different meaning. If you've ever run a small business, you know that it has ups and downs. Economi economists talk about it all the time, about the cycle of the business, where there are years of great abundance and then there's years of nothing. Kind of like the left side of the boat and the right side of the boat in today's story. On one side, there's no fish. On the other side, 150 or so end up in the net. Well, I moved to Fayetteville to start this business because having worked in Eureka Springs for many years before that, the work had come to a close because the city did not have a significant enough sewage system, which had been created back when the town was created, to handle any more building. So I moved to Fayetteville. So I started this business in Fayetteville right before one of the biggest building recessions of that decade. Started out pretty well and I was getting established. I wasn't making any money because I was putting all the money back into the business. And then things got lean. Well, like I said, if you've ever owned a business, you know when things get lean, your worry and anxiety rises. You don't know how long this period of low income is going to last. You don't know if you have enough money and reserves to make it through. Every little dime makes a difference. 
And as this anxiety grew, I got to a point where I wanted to go somewhere where the phone wouldn't ring. And this was before cell phones. And so on weekends, I got in the habit of going out to a nearby lake, camping, and going fishing. It became a distraction, a way to get away from those things that were worrying me, haunting me, the consequences of my decisions in life, worrying about what the future would bring. Fishing was a space to get away. I really didn't care if I caught any fish or not. I just didn't want to hear the phone ring. It also became kind of a retreat. Modern life is not only filled with phones ringing, but to-do lists, email to answer, uh, contracts to write, papers to write, all kinds of things that can take up your day and your week. And before you know it, you don't even know where the time went. And your list can seem just as long as when you started, even though it's not perhaps. And so going fishing, getting out in a way from all of this chaos of modern life, life can be like a retreat, a place of quiet, in my case, a place where you're among nature instead of cars and, and all of the things that go on in modern life. And in that sense, it was a place where I could renew my energy, restore my hope. So that when I returned to go back to work, I had the energy to face the challenges of that day. <clears throat> and then there's also just the plain, ordinary idea that fishing can supply food. Growing up as a preacher's kid in small rural Oklahoma, we did not have much in the way of money. And fishing was a way of helping put food on the table, protein. We also gardened. People in the community, particularly those members of the church, would leave baskets and boxes of food on the porch for us. But fishing was a way to supplement food. And to be honest, I kind of grew up enjoying fish. Maybe it's because my mother liked to serve liver on the other days. But I liked fish. And in, as in the old style, she would fry it in cornmeal. Not necessarily the most healthy way to eat fish. But that's the way I grew up. Fishing can be a source of food, nourishment. In today's story, Jesus is on the shore of Tiberias, the lake of Tiberias. It's called that because there's a little town there called Tiberias. It's a place where the Arabs stopped the Crusaders in their march across the desert because the gap in the mountains of Tiberias was the only way that the crusaders could get to the water that was in the Galilee and the Arabs blocked it with their armies and so the crusaders were in fact defeated as much because of lack of water as from the skill of arms. I actually preached a sermon there once which was kind of neat because an Apache helicopter flew overhead on its way to Lebanon. But just up the road is the head of the lake, and it's where the Sermon on the Mount was given, or thought to have been given. And Peter's home is in that area. And so this area between Tiberias and Peter's home is where this was taking place in Galilee, in the top half of the Sea of Galilee, Tiberias. And the story is starts out with Jesus, well, let me back up. It starts out, obviously, with Peter deciding to go fishing. But then as the story emerges, 
Jesus or this person unknown is on the shore with a fire. Which would not be that abnormal, would it? To be on the side of a lake cooking food early in the morning. But the story tells us that one of the disciples, the beloved disciple, the one who had leaned against the chest of Jesus on the night of the Lord's Supper, recognized him. Why him? Is it something to do with the closeness of our body to the very presence of God incarnate? that gives us the ability to recognize the Messiah in our midst? Maybe. But here are the disciples in their boat. They haven't caught anything all night. Fishermen are aware of this dilemma. You don't always catch a fish. And this beloved disciple recognizes Jesus as the Lord. And says so to Peter. Peter, in his nakedness, puts on his clothes, jumps into the lake, and somehow doesn't drown with all the extra weight, makes his way to shore because that's Peter. Peter is always doing impetuous things. But he does it because he's in love. And he's in love even though he really doesn't know how to love. He just knows he loves. And that leads us to the part of the story that we're most familiar with, and that is when Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? It reminds me of that night where Jesus denied knowing him three times. Is this Jesus' way of saying, I forgive you? We don't know. What we do know is that Jesus asked him three times, do you love me, Peter? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I do. Like most of us, if we were to bump into the Lord and the Lord was to ask us, do we love him, I think we would all answer as Peter answered. Yes, Lord, I do. But by the third time, Peter, being Peter, his feelings get hurt. Aren't you hearing what I'm saying, God? How many times do I have to tell you I love you? Do we ever get impatient with God? <laughs> I think the answer to that is yes. It seems like sometimes God is always asking us the same question over and over and over. What are you going to do about the homeless people on the porch? I'm tired of hearing it, God. What are you going to do about the injustice on widows and homeless people and GLBT people? What are you going to do about the politics? And it's like God is, keeps coming back with the same old thing. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Now, how in the world is feeding sheep going to help solve the problems of this world? For many of us, we have grown up hearing this talked about in terms of spiritual terms, that what we are called to do as the church as that was built by Peter is to feed people spiritually. This church as an institution and all the institutions that have led to this idea of church in a building like this has in many ways been built on this foundation of building people's spiritual beings to feed them spiritually. We sing hymns, some of which we call spirituals. We read scripture. We have prayer. 
we share in the Lord's table. All of this trying to bring to those who gather this sense of spiritual feeding. We feed one another spiritually when we reach out and greet one another and pass the peace of the Lord. It is a spiritual connection that brings us to this place in many cases. We feel connected. We also, in our tradition, when we think of feeding the sheep, we think of feeding those who are hungry those who are marginalized by our society, that we are called by Jesus to reach out to the least of these and to tend to their physical needs. So to feed the sheep is to feed the people who are actually hungry. But there's one other way of understanding feeding the sheep. And I think it goes back to the very question, do you love me? What do we need to do to show our love, to express our love, to be in love with the Lord? What does it mean for us to feed the Lord's sheep? One way of seeing this, and this is the last chapter of John, so it's the culmination of this whole movement beyond, to Jerusalem and beyond. And that is we are about building a kingdom in which the Lord's sheep are fed. That takes us out of the realm of justice as a motivator. It takes us out of the realm of spirituality as a mutually affirming growth in our own spiritual beings to the work of sitting around a campfire on the shore of a sea, a lake, an open field, and figuring out how to feed people. And letting the Spirit enter into that very act of taking fish out of the net, putting it on the fire, and sharing it with our neighbors. John also says they will know you by how you love one another. And it's not how we love one another within these walls because how can they know how we love one another inside these walls? Seven of us here. Do you think anybody out these walls is observing how we love one another here? So when Jesus says to Peter, do you love me, Peter? Feed my sheep. I don't think he's talking about the other disciples in the boat. I think he is talking about how we are called to go out into the common ground of our neighborhoods where people gather or people walk through or people buy groceries. And we are to be in love with the Lord and as lovers of the Lord seek ways to feed those neighbors in whatever way they need. Do they need food? Feed my sheep. Do they need justice? Feed my sheep. Do they need their spirits renewed and restored? Feed my sheep. In just the way that the word love in this passage has three different meanings in the original language, so does the concept of how we reach out and feed the sheep. 
those of you probably have heard this before, one word for love is one of familiar family. Another is the love of lovers, romantic love. And the final one is agape, to love as God loves. In English, it's just one word. But what this gospel is trying to teach those who read it and pray and faithfully seek to understand what it might mean to feed the Lord's sheep. It's all of the above. All of the above. Amen. Amen. Let's go fishing. <laughs>